there is a reason that these awards are being held on this particular night, the eve of Human Rights Day. That's because tomorrow, the 10th of December, is World Human Rights Day, the day in 1948 that the United Nations General Assembly adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The Declaration is a landmark document proclaiming the inalienable rights that everyone is entitled to as a human being, regardless of race, colour, religion, sex, language, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or other status. Nathan, in his warm welcome to country, spoke of the 10-point plan of 1938. I'll make sure that I acknowledge the, 10, the 1938 10-point plan in conjunction with my recognition, recognition of Universal Human Rights Day that came 10 years later. Available in more than 500 languages, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is the most translated document in the world. Setting aside a day to commemorate, educate and reflect on the principles that form the declaration means celebrating the rights we exercise every day as Australians and acknowledging that enjoying those rights carries with it the responsibility of promoting these rights for all people. To help mark this very important day for human rights here in Australia and across the world, we hold a human rights oration. This year to be delivered by Larissa Berendt. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Social Justice Commissioner, June Oscar, was very much looking forward to introducing Professor Berendt, but Commissioner Oscar had to remain in Western Australia. So she sends her best wishes and has asked me to do the introduction instead. I've had the good fortune to know the very distinguished Professor Larissa Berendt for many years. I'm proud and grateful to call her a colleague and a friend. I'm even prouder and more grateful for the incredible contributions that Larissa has made over the last 30 years to advancing the rights, health, safety and culture of First Nations people and communities. Professor Berendt is a shining example of what it takes to be a true champion of human rights. And being awarded last year's Human Rights Medal was a well-deserved honour. Tonight, Professor Berendt will be delivering the 2022 Human Rights Day oration. And no, no doubt she'll deliver it with the intelligence, fierceness and panache that has characterised both her remarkable advocacy and her stellar career. Professor Berendt is currently Director of Research at the Jambana Institute of Indigenous Education and Research right here at UTS. In addition to being an acclaimed legal academic who has published numerous textbooks on Indigenous legal issues, Professor Berendt is an award-winning novelist and filmmaker, as well as the host of Speaking Out on ABC Radio, where she explores politics, arts and culture from a range of Indigenous perspectives. I can't wait to hear this extraordinary woman in what she has to say tonight. So will you please join with me in welcoming distinguished Professor Larissa Behrens. Thank you very much. I'd like to join in, join in paying my respects to Gadigal and the elders who've kept knowledge on this country and shared so generously this unceded land and acknowledge Nathan's leadership in the space in this community that I've been so lucky to live in and also acknowledge the cultural leadership of our elder in residence, Aunty Glendra Stubbs. Before I start, I'd like to thank the Commission for the honour of the 2021 Human Rights Medal. 
The award reflects a long-term effort, but all of you working in human rights will know that it is a team sport. So it's not just for me, but for my many dedicated and passionate colleagues. And so I wanted to acknowledge that I truly do share this honour with the extraordinary team at Jumbana Research, including those who have started the research unit with me, Craig Longman, Jason DeSantelo and Paddy Gibson and also the current team headed by our incoming director, Lyndon Coombs. And I also want to acknowledge those leading the legal reform within the unit, including Alison Whitaker, Latoya Rule and Chris Kinane. Jambana has been strengthened by Paul Gray's leadership in our child protection work and by Daryl Rigney's work in our nation building work. It's a big, big team and I can't name everyone, but each of them stands with me in receiving the award. I want to also acknowledge our outgoing PVC Indigenous Leadership and Engagement, Michael McDaniel, and our act acting PVC, Robin Quiggan, who have unquestioningly supported our work. And we couldn't do what we do without the support and leadership of UTS, and I would like to specifically acknowledge Vice-Chancellor Andrew Parfitt, who has been one of our greatest champions and who has deeply appreciated the importance of our community-led work and advocacy. But most of all, a human rights award like this belongs to the First Nations people and community who have given us the privilege of working with them and beside them, who've shown the most bravery and who have had the most at stake in standing up against human rights violations. So this medal should be seen as recognition of their leadership and determination to change the system. Usually I put my notes together for a speech like this at the last moment. I hate public speaking, so I try and put it off until it's impossible to no longer think about it. But this time I started earlier, I was particularly motivated. I started writing after attending the memorial service in Adelaide for 15 year old Cassius Turvey. I wrote with sorrow for the reminder that we live in a country where you can be killed simply being black and lamenting the message this senseless, hateful killing sends to our young people. The pain felt by mob around the country was exacerbated by a comment by the Western Australian Police Commissioner describing the attack as being a case of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. And I was angered by the unreflective ignorance that reinforced that there is no place to be a safe, that is safe to be a black person in Australia. It was the same week that there was a media story about the treatment of young people incarcerated within Western Australia's Banksia Hill Juvenile Detention Centre. Those of us working within the sector were long aware of the abuses there, and it was reminiscent of what had emerged from the Dondale Youth Detention Centre, where treatment of young people, of children, in detention included being restrained, kept naked, being sprayed with tear gas and with water, being kept in cells with no running water, no air conditioning, no fans, and no direct supply of air. It was a week when there was a reminder that the justice system of this country often fails to treat offenders, even if they are children, humanely and at the same time, offers little to no justice for First Nations victims of crime. Another week to be counted among so many when people came out in force to protest and to stand in solidarity for a death that shouldn't have happened. Tonight, I'd like to reflect on what human rights really means for First Nations people in Australia, particularly in relation to the criminal justice and child protection systems. And I want to challenge those organisations and individuals who advocate for human rights to also reflect on what is needed for real and impactful reform, to call for our human rights advocates to be brave and visible, to speak out not when it's easy, but when it's hard. The Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody in 1991 still stands today as the most comprehensive catalogue for needed reform across the criminal justice and wider legal system. Its 339 recommendations included imprisonment as a last resort, improved training across the criminal justice system, improved health services, better education of the broader community and the need for the guiding principle of self-determination. The recommendations of the Royal Commission are echoed in the coronial findings in individual cases of subsequent deaths in custody, particularly about training and reform of police or custodial procedures. I would assert that every death in custody that occurs due to a failure to implement the recommendations of the Royal Commission is a preventable death.
For me, the death of 22-year-old Ms Du in 2014 is an example of that tragedy. There was her young age, the fact that she was a victim of domestic violence when the police arrived at her residence and then decided to arrest her for non-payment of fines, the failure to take seriously her cries for help due to, to severe pain whilst in custody in the South Headland lockup, the failure of medical staff to properly examine her on the two occasions she was taken to hospital. She was dead on arrival on the third visit in which she was still handcuffed and the overall lack of dignity in the way she was treated. The case of Miss Dew's, the cause of Miss Dew's pain that remained undiagnosed was later determined to be pneumonia and sepsis from broken ribs and injury sustained three months earlier, completely treatable a death completely avoidable. Miss Dooth's deaths could have been avoided if Western Australia did not lock people up for non-payment of fines. It could have been avoided if police officers treated her in the way a victim of domestic violence should be supported. It would have been avoided if Miss Dooth's cries for help due to her pain had been taken seriously, and it would have been avoided if the medical staff had taken time to physically examine her. The facts of Miss Dew's death bear a close resemblance to six Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women whose deaths were investigated as part of the Royal Commission. These included the cases of Nita Blanket, who was refused medical attention while on remand for driving offences, and Muriel Binks, whose calls for medical attention went unnoticed while in custody for non-payment of $30 in fines. The Royal Commission recommended that imprisonment not be used as a punishment for non-payment of fines which is often simply a punishment for poverty. It also recommended that public order offences, including drunkenness, not carry punishments of incarceration. In 2017, Auntie Tanya Day fell and hit her head in a cell in Castlemaine after being arrested for public drunkenness. She was left fatally injured on the floor for three hours, a preventable death, and her family powerfully and successfully advocated for the law reform in Victoria that saw the government undertake to decriminalise public drunkenness, no doubt preventing more deaths in custody along the same line. As the number of Aboriginal children in juvenile detention has grown, so too has the number of Aboriginal children in out-of-home care. While making up only 6% of all children in Australia, today Indigenous children make up 37% of all children in out-of-home care, and despite the Aboriginal child placement principles, there is also a decrease in the percentage of children who are being removed from their families and being placed with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander family. Child protection continues to be a system that works against Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander families, it is a system that equates poverty with neglect, is rife with cultural bias, has little investment in prevention and reunification, but has a bureaucracy bent on keeping Aboriginal children in out-of-home care. There is a much higher chance that children in out-of-home care will end up in the criminal justice system. Of the children in the Dondale Detention Centre at the time of the investigation and the Royal Commission, 60% were in out-of-home or state care. So what do we do to start to truly implement uh, change? And we need to start with implementing the blueprints of the recommendations of the Royal Commission and the Bringing Them Home report. First and most, and most fundamentally, First Nations community controlled organisations must be empowered and genuinely supported. 50 years ago, not far from here in Redfern, the first Aboriginal legal service was created one of our first community controlled organisations. It was driven by an understanding that the system was oppressing Indigenous people, that it was wielded unfairly and to suppress often violently. It was a response to over policing, over incarceration and a response to too many suspicious deaths in police custody. Successive Conservative governments have gutted our Aboriginal legal services, but when funding has been restored, it has never been to the same levels. Over time, the funding of these services has been eroded in real terms. We will not close the gap on overrepresentation in the criminal justice system until our legal services are properly funded. It is humbling in the work we do at Jumbana when we have partnered with Aboriginal legal services, especially with VALS and ALS New South Wales ACT, to see how much they do on so little. 
This underfunding is more absurd when one looks at the evidence that shows that policy and programs work best when they are Indigenous community controlled and led. We see this impact of the sector up close when we work with the community controlled organisations working in child protection, particularly with SNAKE and its Family Matters campaign. And we see it up close with the work of the community controlled health organisations. Self-determination was the key and first recommendation of both the Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody and the Bringing Them Home report. In its true form, it means the greatest transfer of decision-making, policy development, program design and delivery to Indigenous people, and it speaks to the role played by community-controlled organisations. It is not an abstract idea, it works. When strategy rests in Aboriginal hands, it better reflects the interests, values, visions and concerns of the Indigenous group that will be affected and not those of non-Indigenous government bureaucrats, funders or other external bodies. The focus is on what community members think is important and what they know works. Such services are better placed to find the people who fall through the cracks, to actively bring people in through the doors, to work across agencies through informal networks and understand community dynamics and the appropriate cultural leadership. Self-determination has been proven to work in health. Take as evidence the work done by the Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisations in rolling out COVID information to communities across the country well ahead of any government programs. And self-determination offers the best strategy in child protection. Our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander legal services need to be resourced to work similarly in justice. We need a strong, properly supported, empowered, self-determining First Nations community controlled sector to see the changes needed. Secondly, public policy must be evidence-based and the siren call of popularism must be confronted. We know that tough on crime strategies, so popular with state and territory governments, are incompatible with reducing overrepresentation of First Nations people in the criminal justice system. This is particularly so in relation to reforms to bail legislation that limit judicial discretion and inevitably result in increased prison populations due to the increased number of people on remand. For example, including the lack of a permanent address, in other words, homelessness, as a factor that gives rise to a presumption against bail, sees an increase in incarceration rates. Mandatory sentencing has a similar effect. The reality of tough on, on, of tough on crime policies must be called out. It has to be challenged and human rights advocates and voices have to be heard clearly within the public debate. A clear example of this is the campaign to raise the age of criminal responsibility to 14, not to 12, to 14. And I want to acknowledge the work of the Raise the Age campaign and Change the Record, who have lobbied tirelessly for this important policy change that would see the number of our young people in prison drastically reduce and us forced to find better ways to deal with antisocial behaviour in young people. Over my time working in this space, it has been the work of these grassroots community camps led campaigns like Raise the Age, like Family Matters, that have been the most important and inspiring agents of change. I think of the work done by the Barraville families who are still working after over 30 years for justice for the murders of Colleen Walker Craig, Evelyn Greenup and Clinton Speedy Durow. They continue to advocate for changes to the system that will see charges brought against a suspect in these murders. They have changed laws and fought a David and Goliath battle against the legal profession, including at times the Bar Association and the Law Society, for legal reform that would be a pathway to them getting their day in court. And I think of advocates like Karen Robinson Isles, whose advocacy for others now also includes her taking on the Queensland and New South Wales police forces for failure to properly investigate the violent crimes perpetrated against her as a child. And she's not just seeking justice for herself, she is seeking to ensure that police are judged against a duty of care and a minimum, a minimum duty to investigate child sex crimes. And I think of the work of people like Auntie Josie Crawshaw with their campaigning to close the Dondale Youth Detention Centre. I've observed that the clients and communities that we've had the privilege to work with who have suffered injustice have fought for justice for their loved ones 
but also to make sure that what has happened to them does not happen to others. And they have done that while being largely silenced and marginalised by the system. That is why the attack on the right to protest is an insidious one. Protest is a basic freedom within a healthy democracy. The act of peaceful protest is an important mechanism for drawing attention to injustice and a strategy in the process of advocating for law reform. It is a way for the marginalised who the system is silencing to sharpen their message. We cannot hope for change if we are cutting off one of the key ways to agitate for it. And it is here that I wish to make my third point on how real change can be achieved. The responsibility of those committed to human rights to raise their voice when issues are difficult, when public opinion is not on your side, and when it is easy to be muted. Martin Luther King Jr. once said that in the end, it's not the words of our enemies that we will remember, but the silence of our friends. And I've thought about that often, this silence of our friends. At no time have I been felt so let down by our allies in the human rights space than when they were silent as the federal government repealed the Racial Discrimination Act in rolling out the Northern Territory intervention. If a policy can only be implemented by repealing the Racial Discrimination Act, if it can only be implemented by being racially discriminatory, then it is time for voices to be heard, to question the reasons, to demand the evidence and insist that the First Nations people being subjected to the, this, this discrimination be listened to. It was a time of deafening silence to both the Howard government and then to its shame the Rudd government and their same policies in 2008 under the Stronger Futures legislation. Some placed the fear of putting the government off, offside or risking losing public funding or dare I say hopes of personal advancement ahead of the fundamental responsibility to call out what was manifestly wrong. And I want to acknowledge George Newhouse at, of the National Justice Project as one of the few partners Jambana could find on the East Coast to take on cases in the Northern Territory at this time. And it has been a little galling to have recently been receiving fundraising requests from human rights organisations now highlighting conditions in the Northern Territory that have worsened because of the very policies that they remain silent about at the time. Leadership isn't how you act when it's safe. It is how you step up when it is hard. And I'm not saying that standing up against power is easy. News Limited came for me just as it came for the others who stood up to Andrew Bolt and spoke out against the intervention. And I acknowledge the strength of the Human Rights Commission when Gillian Triggs was subjected to similar attacks for her principled advocacy on the plight of asylum seekers and the damage caused by offshore detention. But here's the thing, change is hard. It will be resisted. It comes with personal discomfort and sometimes at personal cost and risk. You are not challenging the system if you only speak when it feels safe to do so. I became a lawyer because I wanted to change the world. But when I entered practice, I found I was simply a cog in a wheel processing people through the system. So I went into research to work more closely on law reform. And I came to understand that evidence-based suggestions would always be trumped by ideological driven approaches and tough on crime strategies. So I became deeply interested in creating space for people through broadcasting or filmmaking to tell their stories, to put the human face on what the impact of failed policies is. All of these things I've spoken about, of the a criminal justice system and child protection system that fail First Nations people, and the need to speak strongly and fearlessly, are manifestations of the big picture for First Nations, and that is the reality of colonisation. Colonisation is a multifaceted project. It is virulent and, and aggressive, and its agenda includes the taking of land, the attempt to eradicate culture, the control of bodies, the violation of women, the segregation from colonial society unless assimilated, and the removal of children from their families and communities. These colonial strategies have contemporary manifestations. 
despite gains in native title and land rights that have led to recognition and reassertion of custodianship over traditional land, Aboriginal land continues to be affected by the desecration of cultural sites and environmental degradation, particularly by mining. The control of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander bodies continues with the increasing number of Indigenous people in custody. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women continue to be overrepresented in statistics as victims of crime. Exclusion from mainstream institutions and lesser treatment by mainstream services is evident in the socioeconomic data and the inability to close the gap and the continual increasing rates of removal of Aboriginal children from their families shows that this is an ongoing process. All of these factors are evidence of a clear continuum between historic colonial assimilationist policies and contemporary activities of the state. For First Nations, the system is broken. It, has been broke, it was broken when the first colonists arrived in 1788 and used the human fodder from their overflowing prisons to colonise First Nations land here. I found it helpful to remember the historic role of the legal system and the police force in the project of colonisation and to understand that there has never been a point where there has been a conscious attempt to change that underlying agenda. The overrepresentation of our women, children and men within the criminal justice system confirms that the colonial project is ongoing. The increasing rates of the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children in out-of-home care show that the colonial project has not altered despite the recommendations of the Bringing Them Home report. It is a system that is also broken. What I have come to learn is that the system will never be fixed with tinkering around the edges by putting more First Nations people within it as lawyers, judges, court officers, police officers. As Gary Foley recently noted, we have never had so many lawyers and never had so many of our people in prison. Ultimately, we need to start afresh. Departments of child protection need to be replaced by empowered community controlled organisations and true self-determination. Child prisons and juvenile detention centres replaced with treatment that respects the humanity and vulnerability of children and strengthens families and communities and work towards abolishing incarceration as a way of punishing and controlling. Crimes of poverty should not be punished by imprisonment. Addiction should not be punished by imprisonment. Mental illness should not be punished by imprisonment. None of this should be radical. First Nations people are the world's oldest living culture and we did not have a prison on this country until 1788, nor did we have a Department of Child Protection. Instead, we had a kinship system that meant everyone had a relationship with everyone else, which meant obligation to one another and to the environment. There was no need for prisons. There was no need for orphanages. There was no homelessness. Turns out this was a sustainable system for over 80,000 years. When Jambana Research worked recently with the Victorian community on the Aboriginal Justice Agreement 4, the community had a long-term vision of an Aboriginal community-controlled justice system. It included Indigenous control over the determination of the goals and aspirations of that system, the allocation of resources, the setting of policy and programs for the Victorian government as it applies to Aboriginal people, uh, developing a legislative agenda and holding government accountable against benchmarks set by the Aboriginal community. What one participant asked would self-determination look like without the mainstream legal service? Justice reinvestment imagines redirecting effort towards prevention. And similarly, though some might bristle at the language, defund the police is about redirecting resources towards addressing underlying issues that lead to criminal offending like mental illness. Colonial law long ago was used by the British to justify their colonisation of Australia. And while the doctrine of terra nullius was overturned in 1992 by the Mabo case, Australia has yet to challenge a more deeply ingrained psychological terra nullius. While more willing to perform welcomes to country and acknowledgements of country, to embrace National Reconciliation Week and NAIDOC weeks, to hang Aboriginal art, these are only a superficial embrace of First Nations perspectives and worldviews, unless coupled with true systemic change and tangible outcomes. In this framework, 
the failure to implement recommendations of the Royal Commission is not a failure of the system to appropriately deal with an Aboriginal problem, but a complacency about changing the system itself and an indifference to the consequences the status quo was producing. Indigenous people are problematised. We are seen as a problem within the system that needs to be fixed. In fact, it is the system that is the problem and in need of repair. Representation, truth-telling and treaty offer potential pathways to this deeper change, but self-determination must be its guiding principle. The true challenge is the extent to which the system is willing to shift power and to see such a change as a positive rather than a negative. So my message is to use your voice to support the work of grassroots campaigns like Raise the Age, like Family Matters, like the petition from the Bowerville families, like the campaign being led by Karen Isles for police to have a duty of care, like the campaign to close the Dondale Youth Detention Centre. Understand that our legal system and child protection systems have not broken their projects of colonisation. Instead, dream of ways to change that, to truly change its purpose, not just tinker around the edges in attempts to ameliorate its negative impacts. Support the concept of self-determination and the leadership of our community controlled sector. And we must support and honour our elders who continue to work tirelessly. Look at Linda Burney leading on the voice to parliament and Pat Turner leading the coalition of peaks and demanding a seat at the table in closing the gap. Use your privilege to speak for others when they can't. Be brave. More importantly, use your privilege to create space for those who are being silenced so that they can tell their story in their own words with their own voice. And when they speak, we should listen and listen deeply. Thank you. Human Rights Medal winner from 2021. That was an outstanding Human Rights Day oration. Thank you. <laughs>